In the last 24 hours, Pope Francis has yet again expressed his desire to go to Russia, to go to Moscow, and to get involved with Vladimir Putin, also the Ukraine, Zelensky. And I was made aware last week that this papal visit to Moscow, Russia, is part of the Garabandel prophecies. And I did a live stream on it. And during that live stream, dozens and dozens and dozens of people were saying, you got to talk to Glenn Hudson. Glenn is the guy. He knows Conchita, who is the primary visionary of Garabandel. So we're going to run that clip today, yesterday, yet again. Since the time I scheduled this interview with Glenn, the Pope has said yet again he wants to go to Russia. So we're going to talk about that part of the prophecy and then whether the Garabandel prophecies are legitimate, um, what's their origin, what is the meaning of them, what's the primary message. So lots of good info today, and I'm very blessed and honored to have Glenn Hudson. Glenn, thank you for coming on today. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. It's my pleasure. Well, we're going to begin. Uh, we'll pray a Hail Mary together. And then uh, we're going to watch this Pope Francis uh, interview from just yesterday on an airplane about Russia, and then we'll jump right into Garabandel. So let's pray a, a Hail Mary together. Oremus. In nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in molieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or pronobis peccatoribus, nunc et et ora mortis nostre. Amen. Nomine Patris et Fidi, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, Glenn, I'm going to run this video. I don't know if you'll be able to see it on your end, but um, you'll probably be able to hear it and we can talk about it. So here is Pope Francis on an airplane, and they're talking about going to Russia and everything involved in that. It's in, it's in Italian, so you have to read the, uh, the clips there. Here we go. Nel 2019, quando si è inginocchiato davanti ai leader del Sud Sudan per chiedere la pace, ehm, purtroppo fra due settimane ci sarà la, il primo anniversario di un altro conflitto terribile, che è quello in Ucraina. E la mia domanda è, lei sarebbe pronto a compiere lo stesso gesto nei confronti di Vladimir Putin se avesse la possibilità di incontrarlo, visto che i suoi appelli alla pace finora sono caduti nel vuoto? E a tutti e tre volevo sapere se This volete fare un appello congiunto per la pace in Ucraina, visto che è un momento raro in cui siete tutti e tre. Grazie. Io sono aperto a incontrare ambi presidenti. I'm open to meet both presidents from Russia and Ukraine. Sono aperto per l'incontro. The reason I haven't traveled to Kiev yet. Se io non sono andato a Kiev è perché non because it's, right now it's not possible to go to Moscow, he said. That's today's show. On the second day of the war, I went to the Russian embassy. And said I was ready to go to Moscow and see Putin. Provided there was a window of negotiation. All right, there it is. Once again. Pope Francis, I believe this is his third time, maybe more. Glenn, how often has Pope Francis been reiterating his desire to go to Moscow? Actually, since 2017, he's been requesting to go. Um, unfortunately, you just can't go to Moscow on your own. He, uh, <laughs> he needs an invitation. So um, I think that can only come from either of two people, either uh, Vladimir Putin or uh, Patriarch uh, Kirill. Right, right. Now, I had read the prophecy before. Do you mind if I read it again, Glenn, and you can kind of break it down uh, sure. where this fits in the whole Garabandel message? So this this message, I believe, comes from, is it 1965? The, mm -hmm. the message about uh, Russia? And yes. actually, I can't find the tab now. Do you have it in front of you? If not, I'll find it. It's in here somewhere. All these tabs. Um, the from the Albrecht Weber. Uh, yes, that's quote. the one. Yes. Yes, I do. I do have that available for. Okay, you. I I found it too. Now, you want me to read it? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Here it is. Uh, 
The Pope, quote, the Pope will go to Russia, to Moscow. As soon as he returns to the Vatican, hostilities will break out in different parts of Europe. And I believe this is related to Conchita talking about the three or four popes until the end of times. So can you give us a background here of what the Garaba prophecies are, the visionaries, uh, for those of us that aren't too familiar about it? Okay, I'm going to try to tie together for you the importance of this trip, what it means to prophecy, uh, what it means to Pope Benedict's passing, and what it means to the end of the times, so we can clarify all these things at once. Okay, so one, one of the most important things that was said during Garbadel was before the warning can actually happen, one of the three prophesied events, the warning, the miracle, and the conditional chastisement, three, three events would happen. And the first was that there would be an important synod. So we, we have that pretty important synod right now, so we can kind of check that off. The second uh, event that was mentioned was that communism will return again. So we can always, uh, we can already see, you know, some of the communist influence coming back, even right here in America, um, it's, it's pretty plain to see. And, and throughout other parts of the world, um, they're experiencing the same things. And the third part of the prophecy was that the Pope would go to Moscow, uh, as you said, and Moscow specifically, because people say, well, he, you know, could go to another part of Russia, no. The Blessed Mother said Moscow, and when he returns from that trip, hostilities would break out in Europe, um, and then I think they're going to escalate uh, far beyond what I, I think we're anticipating. Now, many people have said, oh, this is World War III, and, and the Blessed Mother was very specific. Three, in, in three different instances, she mentioned no World War III. And I know I've taken some criticism for saying this, but I'm going to back this up for two, two reasons. A, the Blessed Mother said it three times, not once. But also, it's logical if you think about it. God's plan is salvation. That's what the warning and miracle are for. It's, it's his last act of mercy for us, for salvation. So why would God allow... Uh, a third, a third world war, a nuclear war, <laughs> if that destroys half of the planet or most of the planet, it, it's not even logical. So I, I'm a firm believer that, yes, there are going to be hostilities. They are going to escalate. Things are going to get bad. But even Mary Lowly said, when things are at their worst, then God would bring the warning to stop everything. And that will expose to every soul on earth the, the way God sees your soul and your sins, not the way we see them. Yeah. So, so now, so just to, to get the chronology, going to get the chronology, we have the three to four popes. We have a pope going to four. Russia or Moscow right. in particular. Moscow is named, not just Russia, but Moscow. And then we have the warning, and that is, please correct me or please explain more. God, through some miracle, everyone on earth, not just Catholics, everyone on earth is going to see their conscience, their sins of commission, their sins of omission. Is that correct? That is correct. There's actually going to be a suspension of time. God is going to stop everything. And even planes, cars, everything stops. Every person will see their soul as God sees it. And as you said correctly, their sins and the gravity of those sins as God sees it, because we don't understand the gravity of sin at all. Because I ask people, uh, what's the difference between lying and stealing or, or, or things of that nature? And they said, well, I, I don't know. I said, of course. Now, that, now you see the purpose of what God wants. He wants you to see the gravity of every sin. And, and it's not to punish people. People don't get it. This is a, an enormous blessing that God is giving you a piece of his knowledge. He's showing you what sin is really like. And as you stated, it's not only the sins that we've committed, it's the, the hurt that we've inflicted on people with these sins, and especially the sins of omission, the things that we should have done. Right. Okay. 
And in, is there any room in here for three days of darkness? Does that fit in here? Is that any part of the Garabandal? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So the last of the third prophecies of Garabandal, the warning, the miracle, and the conditional chastisement is what the Blessed Mother called it at Garabandal. Now, through, through you know, my due diligence, um, it, it to me, it is the same exact thing as other prophecies of the three days of darkness. Um, it's, the, it's a punishment that we face if there isn't repentance after the miracle. So to me, they are the same exact event. Okay. Okay. So that's, so we got illumination. Of, if, if this is all correct, I'm saying if here, mm -hmm. if this is all mm -hmm. correct, we've got three popes, maybe, or the four, well, three to four popes. That. Maybe you can explain that distinction. Uh, then we've got okay. the Pope going to Moscow. Then we've got the illumination of consciences, which is the great warning. Same thing. Correct. That's correct. And then this chastisement, which is likely the three days of darkness. Now, if I've got all that correct and you give me a, a check off on that, can we go back to the three, three slash four popes? But did I get that right? Um, let me just clarify what happened because it's a, a little bit of a confusing issue because people don't take the time to read entire quotes. People have kind of cherry picked the first line of a quote and they've run with that without reading the rest of a quote. So the Blessed Mother is explaining to Conchita how many popes there are going to be after John the 23rd. And initially in her conversation, she says three, but the very next sentence is omitted by everybody, where she says, actually, it's four, but I'm not counting one of them because of his short reign. So now if you understand the second line, it makes perfect sense, especially now with the passing of Pope Benedict. It's crystal clear now as to its four popes. So after John the 23rd, you have Pope Paul the Sixth, John Paul the First, John Paul the Second, Benedict the Sixteenth. So now with, with his passing, there can be no more confusion. The four popes have now passed, and this is the end of the times. That that word is very important because people say the end of time. I no, it is not the end of all time. It's the end of this era, and we're we're entering a new era now. And that new era is going to consist of the three prophecies of Garabandel: the warning, the miracle, and the conditional chastisement. Again, depending on our a reaction to uh, repentance. Okay, so let's. We haven't talked about the miracle yet. I, is that referring to the miracle, the pine? I'm new to all this. I'm trying to put it together. Yes. I, okay. So yeah, so God is going to back up this warning um, because not everybody's Catholic. Um, a lot of people have fallen away from their faith. Some people are agnostic or atheist, don't believe in God at all. So when they experience this warning, they may have some confusion as to what it is, where it came from. So um, I'm sure I'm going to be very busy <laughs> after it happens, explaining it to people. But what happens is God wants to show you a confirmation of what you experience in the warning is only from him and he's going to perform as mary said the greatest miracle ever performed by her son at garabandel and there's going to be a physical uh miracle uh at the pine trees where the blessed mother appeared at garabandel and that's going to be permanent so and it's almost a two-stage event there's going to be about the way conchita described it to me there's about 15 minutes of something that happens and then there's going to be a permanent sign for eternity left at Garabandel. And that's going to be your confirmation of what you felt during the warning and that it was from God. Okay, so this is the miracle of the pines. And I'm confused because I've never been to Garabandel. Is this, is this a grove of trees? Is this a forest? What is this location? You know, actually, it was Conchita's grandfather uh, in 1925 that thought it would be a, a, an interesting idea to plant a pine tree 
to each of the children that were being um, confirmed of that year. So they planted nine pine trees. And those nine pre trees are basically have been there. Uh, one of them got hit by lightning uh, and they had to replant it. Um, but that was Mary's uh, favorite spot to appear during the apparitions. And, and I'll tell you something interesting about this. Um, the Blessed Mother actually told Conchita, this ground is sacred. God loves this place. That was Mary's quote. So that's a pretty amazing quote that he singled out this, this area of, of, of Spain. Okay. And then the only thing I can think of with Our Lady appearing and then leaving a permanent sign, the only analogy I have, if this is true, would be Guadalupe. Our Lady appears to Juan Diego and then she leaves the miraculous tilma, like an image of herself. So is that the kind of thing that we should expect, like a sacred image that's left behind? Or is it going to be well, like an aura I, of light? Or what? what is this permanent sign well, going you know, to be? Yeah, there, there, there wasn't a lot of uh, information available um, on this particular subject from Conchita. Uh, I only found one specific quote, um, and to me, it was uh, almost a reference to the Old Testament. When Moses was leading um, his people out of Egypt, there was a, a luminous cloud uh in, in in the daytime and i believe it turned into a, a column of fire at night and there was only one reference to this uh that conchita said so i think that this may be and I, i'm saying may because i'm not 100 percent certain because there is no uh information about this other than this slight quote that i was able to find so maybe that's part of of the miracle that that a luminous cloud, and then the, uh, you know, the column of fire at night. Okay. All right. So since I did a video on Garabondel, as you might imagine, Glenn, I've had a hundred people say Garabondel is fake. And I've had a hundred people say, I'm so glad you're covering Garabondel. It's so amazing. So Tell us about whether this, I mean, I've always avoided Garbondel because I've been told repeatedly it's not approved and I don't spend any time usually on anything that's not approved. However, as I began okay. to look into it and study, I found some pretty powerful references to Padre Pio, St. Pio, and his connection to Garbondel. And then I was, of course, yeah. interested in these modern day connections of things that were being prophesied by Conchita at Garbondel that seem to be unfolding in our own time with Pope Benedict dying on December 31st, the Pope, Moscow, the four popes in succession. So is this approved? And then what is Padre Pio's connection? But let's begin with, is this approved? Should we even be talking about this? Absolutely. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of confusion about whether it's approved or condemned. Or, it's not approved. It's not condemned either. And, and here's, uh, I, I saw the article that was posted on uh, last week's uh, podcast. And there's, there's quite a few errors actually in that story. Um, first of all, there's no documentation of what they claim in that newspaper article in the Vatican archives. I checked and I believe I sent the link to you so that you could check. Um, so A, that, doesn't, that didn't exist, what they said. They also said in that article that Conchita was never at the Vatican. And um, it's kind of funny to me because she wasn't there once. She was there twice. And, and, and she has a list of w w witnesses who were with her the first time. Besides uh, Cardinal Ottaviani, who did a two and a half hour interview with her, saw her twice. The Pope, her mother. Uh, Dr. Mede, um, Father Luna, uh, Princess Cecilia from Bourbon. These are all the witnesses that she was at the Vatican. So did she so meet the Pope? Article, she met, yes. After, after the interview with uh, Cardinal Ottaviani, uh, they set up an, a private interview the next day with Pope Paul. And at that meeting, um, they discussed the apparitions. 
he uh, was very much in favor of the things that she said. And his final comment was, Conchita, I bless you, and the whole church blesses you. So that's a pretty strong comment mm. coming from, from Pope Paul VI. And what year was that? Um, so the, what year? Uh, in, 1966, uh, January of 1966 was the okay. first visit. Uh, 68 uh, February of 68, I think, was the second visit. Uh, but that was a very secretive visit. Um, even Conchita won't tell me what happened, uh, what happened in that second one. But one of the most interesting things is Conchita revealed the date of the future miracle. Uh, she knows this date, and she's going to give us an eight-day warning uh, of the miracle day. She revealed that date to Pope Paul VI. Now, I know a little bit about Vatican goings on, and they all have personal secretaries. And his personal secretary was also with him when this was revealed. And, and my strong feeling is that that information was handed down from Pope to Pope. And that's one of the reasons that Pope Francis has been so adamant about going to Moscow. And I, I could be wrong, but it certainly ties together with Garabindel perfectly that since 2017, he's been begging to go to Moscow. And people are like, why does he want to go to Moscow? Well, I, I believe he knows that this is part of prophecy, and he's going to be the person that fulfills this prophecy. Um, so you think so Pope let's, Francis let's, knows the date? Uh, you know, again, if this was handed down, may, maybe. Uh, that's something I can't say with certainty, but it, it is almost inexplicable why he's you know begging to go to moscow for six years because he really hasn't given a reason really you know we have the war now but there was no war in 2017 why was he asking to go six years ago so you know people can't give you an answer for that so again that's you know that's my theory you could do with it what you will now, you brought up Padre Pio, and, and thank you for doing that, because he really is the savior of Garib Um it, it was met with so much resistance in the beginning, and I'll get into why um, the, the original bishop caused so much confusion on purpose. But let's cover Padre Pio, because so many people uh, feel he's infallible, what he says. So in 1961, Joey Lamangino is, is exhausted, and his doctor tells him, you know, Joey, you need a rest. And I don't know if you know the story of Joey. He was blinded at the age of 16. He was filling up a truck tire and it exploded and it the rim hit him in the forehead, it creased his forehead and mm. severed all the olfactory nerves that he had. So he instantly went blind and lost sense of smell. And he didn't wake up until the feast of the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel uh, from a coma. 16 years later, his uncle takes him to Italy for a vacation. And as they're at uh, uh, the, I believe it's a 5 a.m. mass for Padre Pio that he would always do. Um, Padre Pio walks past Joey and pinches him on the cheek and just keeps going. And Joey feels a sense of, uh, of, of, of either holiness or something that uh, you know, kind of hits his body and, 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 and starts to change him spiritually. Now, two years later, 63, he goes back with his uncle, only he goes to confession this time to Padre Pio. And he's telling Padre, Padre Pio his sins, and he goes, and Padre Pio says, is that it? And he goes, yeah. And then he, <laughs> Padre Pio goes on to tell him all of his sins. And, and Joey starts to cry. And, you know, he says, Joey, I call Jesus and Mary for you. And with that, um, two days later, Joey goes back to see Padre Pio again. And at this meeting, Padre Pio comes up to Joey and Joey throws his arms back in protection. He smells roses. Padre Pio touched his forehead where it was severed and he instantly regains his sense of smell. So it's a miracle. And, and, at that meeting, he says, you know, that uh, he's talking to him and he says, I understand these, these apparitions in, in Garabandel. Is it true? And Padre Pio says, yes. And he says, should I go there? And he says, yes. And Joey goes to Garabandel and it's the first of countless visits. And 
you know, he becomes very close friends with Conchita. And, um, you know, uh, Conchita eventually winds up moving back to New York. And um, so that's the initial tie to Padre Pio. He was always a great defender of Garabandel. And I think one of the most amazing things about Conchita is two of her closest friends were Padre Pio and St. Mother Teresa. And, and Mother Teresa even stood uh, there uh, um, their sisters stood as a godmother for one of uh, Conchita's daughters. So, you know, if, if you want validity in a visionary, you've got St. Padre Pio, you've got Mother Teresa, you've got uh, Pope Paul, St. Pope Paul VI, you've got St. John Paul II. Um, so it's, it's pretty good validation that, um, you know, what she says is, is no fabrication. And it's pretty tough to refute anything that, that Padre Pio defends verbally. Um, so let's maybe cover now, wh where did this confusion come from of, is it, is it approved? Is it not approved? It's technically, it's actually waiting approval. Because when Pope Paul VI was given the date, the, the church in its prudence thought, well, we can, we, we can wait. And if it happens, like you say, then we'll approve it. You know, that's basically the inference we got. Um, but it really comes down to the first three bishops. Now, the first bishop, Fernandez, was only there for a few months. And what caused this man to have uh, such a dislike of the apparitions? You would think he would embrace it and investigate it, but he didn't. And, I, and I'll explain why. Very few people have ever heard of the apparitions in Esquiaga, Spain, in 1931. The Blessed Mother appears to two children, and at that time, she gives these children a messages of repentance now, an eight-day warning of a miracle, a miracle, and then a possible chastisement. Now, what does that sound like? That's exactly what was said at Garavandel. So now, this bishop... 30 years exactly to the year, 1961, the Blessed Mother is now appearing at Garamandel. And what's being said? Repentance now. Warning. Miracle. Eight-day warning before the miracle. Possible chastisement. And at, in Eskiaga, uh, what happened was there was a civil war going on during an, it was an election. And the socialists won that election. And the first thing they try to do is crush religion. And they wanted this apparition squashed from these two children and everybody to stop talking about it. Because, you know, let's face it, it that gives people hope that, that God is with them and listening to them and warning them. So they threatened the Jesuits and said, if you don't stop talking about this apparition and if you approve it, we'll start killing the Jesuits. It's as simple as that. So, so the local bishop then squashes that and, and, and denies that apparition is true. So it's 30 years later, he hears these same messages being given, and he goes out of his way to try to crush this apparition. So much so that how do you hold an investigation if you never interview the children? You never interview their parents. You never take a written statement from anybody who thought it was a true apparition. These, this is just the beginning. It gets so bad that by the second bishop, he won't even interview anybody either, but he assigns three doctors to basically find a way to shut this, shut this apparition down. Find me medical evidence. So one doctor completely refuses, Dr. Punzenauer refuses. He says, as a, as, as a Christian and a Catholic, I, I can't deny this. You know, I'd be going against my faith. So that's a problem. The, the second doctor is, is, is the genius, Dr. Morales. He, try, he can't get Conchita to lie and say the apparitions aren't true. So he tries to hypnotize her. <laughs> and with that, as soon as he starts speaking, the Blessed Mother appears to Conchita and she goes into an ecstatic state and doesn't hear anything. And then the third doctor just put out a report that says, 
these children are suffering from seizures. That's what this is. So now you have no, no real investigation. You have the medical people can't disprove it. And as a matter of fact, the more they try to disprove it, the more it proves it's true. They start by pinching the girls in an ecstatic state and the girls have no feeling. Well, then they go to let's let's hit uh, pit, uh, pinch them with pins. <laughs> There's no reaction. They start to try to burn them with matches. <laughs> There's no reaction. Wait, are they doing Two this? They're men. doing this during the ecstatic state? Yes. To, they're trying to disprove that the girls are in an ecstatic state. And they're holding matches to the girls? Yeah, this is this would this is would be unheard of today. This would be criminal what they did to these these young girls. These are two, 11 and 12 year old girls. Could you imagine if somebody did that to your daughter? Try to burn them with a match. And then and then they they want to move the girls to show that they're not in an two grown men can't move a single 11 year old girl off the ground and and this is it gets so bizarre they're so they're so bent on disproving this they actually take conchita from her home bring her to a beach town because they think if she's alone we can get her away from everybody and we'll get her to confess so they hit the they try to hypnotize it. That doesn't work. They cut off all of her hair. They left her with a very, very short haircut because they thought her hair had magical powers. Can, can you imagine a, a medical doctor doing this? Um, it, and it goes on and on. They actually were so uh, convinced that they could get her to change. They said, well, if you don't change, when you go back to Garabandel, you're going to be put in jail for lying and we're going to put your mother in jail for lying or we'll have a committed to an insane asylum so with that they she they they say sign this piece of paper and it's blank <laughs> so she wants to go home she's 12 years old she's alone they just cut off her hair she signs this blank piece of paper <laughs> and then she's returned home now no report is ever sent to the Vatican. So there's your proof that through the first three bishops that lived through all of the visions, no report was ever constructed. Nothing was ever sent to the Vatican. So this is where all this confusion comes in. And you have this one statement by um, the last bishop where he basically says, apparitions aren't true, Blessed Mother never appeared, St. Michael was never here. The interesting thing about that is there's a backstory that St. Mother Miravallis goes to the bishop and says, listen, I, I hear you're going to write this note about Garamandel. I'm warning you not to, because it, it could be, it could bring on your, de your death. She warns him on April 25th of this, he sends out the note in the beginning of May and then dies in a car accident in May. Wow. So that's where all of this confusion started. And uh, one of the most interesting things is one of the priests that he assigned to head up this commission, the, the first commission, he's so convinced he resigns from the commission itself. And later, he actually becomes one of the bishops, Bishop Del Valgallo, and he reopens a new investigation in 1987, and that was sent to the Vatican. And what happened in 1987 when it was sent to the Vatican? Well, again, it's, it's considered still an open case. It's, it's, there's never been an official pronouncement from the Vatican on this and again if if you go back to what i said earlier i think they're just going to wait it out to the miracle date and then, which, which you know, no one now, knows which no one knows or maybe well, conchita somebody knows. conchita knows and maybe someone well, in the vatican yeah, knows. yeah okay all right now one of the things that people who have contacted me said hey garbandel is not real is they they speak of the man who regained his sense of smell with padre pio 
But apparently there was right. some prophecy about him getting his eyesight back and he died blind. And so people, naysayers say, this is proof that Garabandel, there's something wrong with Garabandel. Can you right. speak to that? Sure, I can. Okay, so we're talking again about Joey Lamangino, who, uh, okay. you know, I, I described earlier, went to Padre Pio several times. Um, the prophecy was that Mary said her exact words were, she told Conchita, was that, Joey will see on the great day of the miracle. That was the exact quote. Okay. So the inference is yes, he sounds like he's getting a new set of eyes so that he can see the miracle. But that was the exact quote. He will see on the day of the miracle. Well, he's gonna see he's gonna see it from heaven now. But I, I can understand where the confusion comes from. Okay, so now, so so Glenn, she didn't. She didn't say you. He will regain his sight. She said he will quote see. That he will see on the great day of the miracle. Now, in, in because of my friendship with Conchita, um, I had heard a rumor some time ago that uh, on uh, when Joey was passing away, um, he had suffered greatly the last few years of his life. I believe it was somewhere, uh, multiple heart attacks, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of like 10. Um, he fell down a flight of stairs. The doctors recommend, uh, accidentally gave him the wrong medicines. He had reactions. I mean, the man just suffered terribly the last several years of his life. And I had heard a rumor that a priest was talking to him and he said that he was going to offer up in exchange for his eyesight that the, chain, the church accept and approve Garabandel. So I, I called Conchita. I said, did, did you hear this rumor? And she says, it wasn't a priest. I said, oh, who, who, do you know who it was? She goes, yeah, it was me. <laughs> I was there. So now she's telling me that that's what Joey said. That was his offer, that he would forego his sight and, and life for the acceptance of Garabandel. So, you know, nothing is going to stop God from his plan. So whether Joey has eyesight or not, does anybody really think God is going to cancel the warning and miracle and salvation for the planet because Joey decided to forego his eyesight? I don't think so. Now, there are, there's not just Conchita. There were, were there four visionaries in the beginning? Yes. So there were four girls, uh, Conchita Gonzalez, her cousin Jacinta Gonzalez, Mary Loli Maison, and Mary Cruz. So there were four girls. All right. Good. Now, some of the video footage is, is controversial. So people will say this is supernatural. This is of God. Other people will say mm, there's something wrong here. It's preternatural. This could be demonic. And I'm referring to them walking or running backwards and then them being so heavy they can't be picked up. Have you? I'm sure you have spoken to Conchita on this. Can you maybe address the concerns of, of people who bring up these two elements? Sure. So let's address the, uh, the worst uh, slander against Garabandel is that it's demonic. First of all, Think about the four years that the Blessed Mother was there. What was said? What was her message, really? We must lead good lives. What did she say? Go to church. Receive communion. Go to frequent confession. Say the rosary. Wear a scapula. How does that benefit the devil in any way, shape, or form? That's four years of constant messaging that she gave everyone. And it wasn't so much about these predictions of the future. She just simply said, lead good lives and do these things. So that's your first problem. The second problem is most of the exorcists were done beginning with a rosary. How is that demonic? The third thing, let's go to the walking backwards. A million people have said this to me. I said, have you ever walked backwards in your life? Well, then you're demonic. Well, you know, these girls, they walk backwards. I said, yeah. Do you know why? 
I said, they were in ecstasy inside the church in front of the uh, Blessed Sacrament. And when Mary led them out of the church, she led them out of the church walking backwards as a sign of respect for the Eucharist. And the, the theme of the Eucharist runs all through Garabandel. And the, one of the greatest forms of proof of Garabandel is what's called the little miracle. So many people started coming to Garabandel and, and Conchita wanted a sign so undeniable that no one could refute it. And she begged the Blessed Mother to show something. Give, give us a sign that no one can refute. So St. Michael said, uh, I'm going to give you 15 day notice of a Eucharistic miracle. And 15 days later, at night, Conchita knelt down outside and she stuck out her tongue. And this is on film. It's on, uh, you know, still camera. Uh, hundreds of witnesses. She sticks out her tongue. There's nothing there. And, and immediately an illuminated host appears on her tongue. So that's irrefutable to me that it was done in front of predicted in advance, 15 days in advance, witnessed by hundreds on film that her tongue was empty and this host appeared out of nowhere. So again, how is Garabandel demonic when I've explained away everything? It's uh, not, it's impossible. Another one that I've heard, Glenn, maybe you can explain it is, uh, so they're, the children are presenting items to the Blessed Mother. And at one mm -hmm. point, someone presents a compact, like a makeup compact, and Conchita yeah. is not is not so sure about presenting something secular to Our Lady. Can you explain that one? Because I find that one pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm going to explain the uh, uh, the previous story of what happened. So when the Blessed Mother first appears, um, the girls, you know, they're 11, 12 years old. They want a little souvenir that she's there. So they, the ground is covered in rocks and small pebbles. So they, they offer her pebbles and stones to kiss. So they have something. So Mary, being the loving mother that she is, she, she does this initially, but she says, why don't, why don't you bring me sacramentals instead of, you know, instead of rocks? And people in the town start bringing, you know, uh, uh, Bibles, prayer books, uh, rosaries, scapulas, wedding rings, uh, these types of things to be kissed. So at, at one day, she's, she is presented with this compact case, a cosmetic case. And she's like, this, this is kind of a object of vanity to, to a certain extent. I, I really don't want to present this. And Mary explains to her that during the Spanish Civil War, this compact case was a pix used to carry her son. So she gladly kisses it and gives it back to its owner. Yeah, and a pix, for those that don't know, it's a little golden box, looks like a makeup compact that you put the priest puts hosts in when he goes to the hospital or a sick call that he carries. It's like a little tabernacle that he carries. So I guess someone had used this as sort of a incognito pix during the war, and no one would have known that, but somehow this was revealed. So I, I found that one that was that was kind of interesting. You know, I'm I'm just trying to weigh all of this out. So I'm looking at, you know, the apparitions, the messages, the preternatural or supernatural, um, and then the claims being made. So now is there any, I thought there was something more about Padre Pio. Didn't he have another statement and didn't, didn't he leave some things to Conchita and does she still have them? Can you connect those yeah. dots? Um, yeah, sure. Um, upon his passing, um, Conchita was notified by one of, Padre Pio's uh, the closest friends, uh, Father, uh, I think it was Senator, Senator, Mina, Sen, like Senator Manaro. I'm sorry about the pronunciation. Anyhow, he contacts Conchita and he says, I have some, some items for you. You know, could you meet me in Lourdes? And he presents Conchita with one of Padre Pio's bloody gloves with a piece of bandage on it, his personal rosary, and one of the veils that covered his face during his wake. So this priest actually tells Conchita, you know, I, I never believed in Garabandel, but now I do. 
because for him to bequeath you these items that were so personal to him, and of all the people in the world, he chose you alone to have these. He says, now I'm convinced that Carabindel is true. And yes, I've seen all of these items and, and others uh, at her house. Um, we, we both live in New York. So, so Conchita uh, yeah, has, I, I, has all of these relics that were that she inherited by name from Padre Pio. Yes. Wow. So after he died, yeah. they were sent to her. Yes. Well, again, uh, she went to uh, Lourdes uh, to meet this priest to uh, get these items. Okay. And, and the priest was instructed, these are to be given to Conchita. Yeah, he, uh, he was given, a, he was left a letter from, from Padre Pio because of their close friendship wow. in uh, San Giovanni. And so what year did she get these items? I mean, that's, that's like a, that's a big deal. I mean, I'm trying to figure this thing out, but Padre Pio leaves her a bloody glove and, you know, these items says these have to go to Conchita. I mean, that's, yeah. that's saying uh, something. I mean, if, that, if that isn't a confirmation beyond his verbal word that he, he selects one person in the world to have these items, um, how can you how can you question what he says? Um, I believe I believe he died in sixty eight. Mm -hmm. Yep, nineteen sixty eight. Yes. So and you've you've seen that Conchita has these items. You've seen them. Oh yeah, I, I've been to her house countless times. I've I've been friends with her for thirty years. So I I've seen these relics firsthand. I have pictures of them. Um, if you would like. Uh, People can come to my website. I'll, I'll post them. You can see the items. Wow. Um, and one of the interesting, one of the interesting things is, um, you know, basically my my page is the only page that she speaks to uh, on the entire internet um, because of our longtime friendship and, and trust. And uh, she allows me to post personal stories, events that have happened in her life when she wants to convey a message. Um, you know, during the pandemic. Uh, I asked her, you know, people are concerned, they're scared. Could you, could you maybe write, you know, something for us? And she, she wrote my page a letter and gave me permission to post it. So um, there's many personal and interesting stories about her life. Um, I just released one. It's probably my favorite is uh, the Christmas story. So um, I was speaking to her Christmas week and I said, does your family still celebrate Christmas the same way? And she says, yeah. I said, even after all these years? And she said, yeah. So I said, can I tell my people on my page the story? And, and she certainly said, sure. So what, what her family does is they have a Kris Kringle for Christmas. So starting on Thanksgiving night, after dinner, they put everyone's name in the family in a hat, and everybody picks a name. And you do a rosary for that person for all of Advent until Christmas Day. And then on Christmas Day, you hand them uh, a mass card for their intentions and then let them know that it was you that's been praying for them uh, all through Advent. I don't, I don't know of anybody who celebrates Christmas that way. I, I think that's amazing. And if that yeah. isn't a sign of a holy person, someone who lives their faith, I, I don't know what else I can say about this person, that she would raise her children that way. Yeah, that's beautiful. I like that tradition. That's good. I want to go back to the the Padre Pio relic. So you said that I think there was four items, and I remember it was the face cloth over Padre Pio at his funeral, one glove, and what were the other ones? I think I missed it. His personal, well, it was a personal rosary. Okay. His personal rosary. And then there was also a, a very large uh, bandage um, that was sent to her later on. Um, but the three the three gifts that were bequeathed to her on his passing was the veil that covered his face at the wake, his personal rosary, and then this glove, uh, which also has a small a piece of a bandage uh, in it. Okay, so so to make the con I'm trying to understand all the Padre Pio connections. So we have his statement to Joey, where he affirms Our Lady is appearing at Garabondo. Right. We we have the um, the relics bequeathed 
to Conchita. And I, I think there's another one, isn't is there a, is there a letter or something that's in publication? Because I think I've read something oh. where Padre Pio yeah, it was, it was, specifically states it. What what is that? Yeah, there were several letters written to the girls uh, in Garibaldel, uh during the ecstasy years. So those letters, uh, again, you can see them uh, online or on my page. Um, and it's basically, you know, telling the girls that he supports them and prays for them. And, and you know, he's afraid that people are going to pay attention to Garibaldel when it's too late. Yeah, I I have a book here. This is this is from um, uh, Xavier Reyes Ero. I might be saying it wrong. Revelations, but he he publishes this letter. I'm going to read it if that's okay with you, Glenn. And you tell me if this is legit. Sure. Uh, this is allegedly Padre Pio in a letter written in Italian to the four visionaries at San Sebastian de Garbandal. Dear children, at nine o'clock this morning, the Holy Virgin told me to say to you. O oh, blessed young girls of San Sebastian de Garabanda, I promise you that it that I will be with you until the end of the centuries, and you will be with me during the end of the world, and later united with me in the glory of paradise. Attached to this letter is a copy of the Holy Rosary of Fatima, which the Blessed Virgin ordered me to send you. The Blessed Virgin has dictated this rosary, and she desires it to be made known unto the salvation of sinners and to preserve humanity from the worst punishments that the good God is threatening it with. My recommendation is this, pray and encourage others to pray because the world is on its way to perdition. They do not believe you or our conversations with the white lady, but they will believe when it is too late. And then he explains the rosary, the Virgin of, of Fatima. I thought it was interesting here that says, but they will believe when it is too late. Now, is this an authentic Padre Pio letter? And then if it is, what does this mean that yeah. they will believe when it's too late? Well, yes, it is. Um, and uh, if I had it in front of me, I would produce it, but I can certainly send it to you that okay. when, uh, when Conchita received this letter, um, everyone wanted confirmation that it was from Padre Pio. So, Conchita asked the Blessed Mother specifically, and she did confirm on a certain date that that was from him. So uh, I feel confident uh, that there's no question that that was from him. Um, there are also stories uh, written in one particular book of Padre Pio bilocating up to five times to Garabandel to see Conchita. So I think that's that's pretty important also because I don't know that there are too many stories where He's done that for anybody in particular. Um, so that coupled with the gifts that he gave her uh, obviously means, uh, you know, he was she was very important to him. Yeah, I mean, and, and if, if the letter's real, I mean, Padre Pio is saying they don't believe you or our conversations with the white lady. Yeah. Of course, Padre Pio during this time period, this was in 1962, he was in his own trouble. He had been in trouble with Pope John the Twenty Third, so yeah. that's that's interesting that he is grouping the Garabandel children with himself. That they don't believe you, you or our conversations yeah. with the White Lady. So, if this letter is legit, is there a copy of the letter still in existence? I, I think that would be very yeah, important. Yeah, I, I have that. I, have, I uh, you do. I can, okay. I can send that. Yeah, I have the photo of it and um, and the date that I spoke of earlier of when Mary confirmed it. I'll, I'll send all that to you. And again, it's always available on my page. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's important. So if if someone were to say Garabandal is disapproved, is it disapproved or not yet approved? Is it in limbo? What is this? What is the status? What is the proper way of understanding this? Because, I mean already so, well, i've received a a massive amount of people saying this is fake don't dare talk about it it's super bad then there's all these other people saying this is great so glad you're talking about it i want to be completely open i always try to be completely open about what i'm thinking what i'm studying and so you know i'm not convinced one way or the other but i am i mean i'm i'm kind of in awe over if this is legit 
and then these connections with Padre P and all that. So what is there, is it disapproved or non-approved? What's the, what's the way we understand? You know, if you want to use my term, it's awaiting approval. So first of all, there is no, no official ruling from the Vatican. So let's, let's make that crystal clear. So, there is so no the Vatican problem. has never said anything. No, never. no, there's not a, ever said anything. A, and as a matter there, of is, fact, if you go, if you is go there back a papal to the statement, of, Vatican statement, there's nothing in existence. No. Oh. So you have that. Um, and as a matter of fact, if people, because people don't really delve into this, they believe what they want to believe, or they take bits and pieces of little stories. Um, this is so long ago. If you go to modern day, um, Bishop Zamora um, was bishop from 2007 through 2015. He changed the course of everything in Garabandel because no bishop had ever said mass at Garabandel. He did two masses at Garabandel. And at one of them, he actually took the time to kiss a crucifix that Mary kissed. So it's not that uh, these bishops are all hardliners uh, against Garabandel. Again, the early ones who did no investigation whatsoever and never submitted anything to the Vatican, their their opinion is worthless, honestly, because they were lying, quite frankly. Um, they did nothing of, of, of any consequence to try and prove or disprove. All they wanted to know was, we're going to try and shut this down. But this overwhelming evidence uh, for four years that the Blessed Mother appeared there. It's it, how, You can't explain the things that the girls did. There's no natural explanation. It has to be supernatural. It has to be divine intervention. But Zamora, in, in those years, he went to Garabandel twice. Um, that gave a great uplift to the Garabandel movement because you finally had a bishop who took the time, did his due diligence, looked into everything that was being said, looked into the countless miracles that people were cured of at Garabandel from kissed items um, and celebrated the two masses and kissed the crucifix. So, And what, what year was you know, that? You what, you want. What, what year did that bishop go to Garabandel? I believe it was 2012 was the first mass okay. that he did there. Wow. And again, okay. I can send you documentation of that too. And what's the current status? I, everything, everything, I want you to know that everything I tell you, I can back up with documentation. These are not my opinions. These yes, are that's, facts. that's what I'm here for. I want facts, documentations. Absolutely. So what is the current status? I mean, I, people go to Garabandel. What's the local bishop, the local priest? I mean, can you go there? Is it restricted? What, what's it like There's at Ground no Zero? No, uh, in, in 80, I believe it was 87. Remember I told you about the uh, bishop, uh, the, uh, the priest who be put the commission, became bishop, did his own investigation, Bishop Del Valgallo. He yes. lifted any ban against priests because they had tried to put a ban on priests going there. He lifted that. So priests are welcome there. Masses are said there. There are pilgrimages there all the time, every day. Um, so there are no restrictions. And, um, you know, basically, you're you're left to your own decision with this. If if people take the time and and do their due diligence, they'll see. There's no doubt in my mind that this is true. And if anyone is is confused, how do how do you contradict Padre Pio? Who of us is spiritually wiser than Padre Pio and Mother Teresa? Now the other, I haven't th met that. the other three seers, are they still alive as well, or is it just Conchita? So we got Mary Cruz, Jacinta, Conchita, and Mary Lowly. What, what are they still all? Do all four say this is legit? We believe in it. It all really happened. Everyone's still saying that this is a legitimate apparition. Okay, so let's go over uh, where everybody is. So Conchita uh, will be celebrating her. 74th birthday tomorrow. Oh, wow. Uh, Happy birthday, Conchita. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Jacinta, her cousin, uh, is alive and well. Also, 
going to be 74 this year. She lives in California. Uh, Mary Cruz uh, lives in Avia, Spain. Um, she's going to be 73 this year. Uh, but unfortunately, Mary Lowley passed away uh, in 2009 um, from a combination of problems, uh, one of them being lupus. Um, so Conchita, Jacinta, Mary Lowley, all uh, very supportive uh, of the apparitions, um, and nothing has changed with them. Okay. Unfortunately, Mary Cruz's story is a little bit different because of her parents. Um, during the initial uh, apparitions, you can imagine that this is a very remote uh, town at the top of a mountain. It's so remote that there's no electricity. It's a very simple way of life. Everybody knows everybody. And when your 11-year-old comes home and says, I've, I've just seen St. Michael or I've just seen the Blessed Mother and she's talked to me, you can imagine their immediate reaction was, was concern. And some people obviously were doubting. Some people were going to the extreme and, and ridiculing the parents saying, why do you let your daughter walk around saying these things? You know, she sounds crazy. But, you know, you have to remember there's four of them experiencing this, not one. They're all four experiencing. So uh, are these girls at 11 and 12 years old from this remote town that, that, that's never had a TV or a radio, how do they come up with a story so, you know, so incredible and they all match? But unfortunately, Mary Cruz's parents just couldn't take the ridicule. And they started to stop her from going to these um, these callings that they had. When Mary would appear, she would call the girls three times. And on the third time, Mary would appear. Um, so unfortunately, she lost her visions first. And so she's in a little bit of a, a state of confusion. She contradicts herself a lot and says, you know, I, I, yeah, I do remember certain things. I don't remember this, I, you know. So unfortunately, uh, her testimony is 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 not uh, rock solid in one way or the other. But the other three are all in agreement. Okay. Now, w one of the things you had mentioned at the very beginning of today's interview, that one of the things that Conchita had mentioned was a synod. And we're currently in the ongoing never ending it seems synod on synodality which globally not just in europe but also in places like south america and here in america the synod of synodality is sort of this consultation with not just lay people but non-catholics and there's a push for you know same-sex weddings and major changes women's ordinations and there's this one episode here regarding the synod or the council and if you don't mind it's from 1966 uh, i believe and i'm going to read it here glenn and i'd love to have your commentary it says during the apparitions the virgin told conchita that before the future events occur a synod will take place an important synod then conchita told the story to her aunt and the aunt said do you mean a council because that was the time of the Second Vatican Council. Conchita told her aunt, no, the Virgin didn't say council, she said synod. And I think a synod is a small council. So that's an interesting detail there. It's, you know, it's that, the Moscow, yeah. Russia, all these things seem to be referring to things happening right now. And that's why we're having this discussion, this interview on Garabandel. Have you spoken to Conchita about this episode and the distinction between synod and council? And does, does Conchita believe that this synod is the synod of synodality right now? Well, uh, let, let's do this. Uh, I, I won't comment if she's, she's, she hasn't said that this is the one, um, but th that is my interpretation that this is the one. And uh, let's point out something very important. In the 1960s, there was no synods yet. There was no synods. So this is a term of the future. So also, how does a 12-year-old know the word synod? How does, how does a 12-year-old know the word perdition? 
when she spoke about the priests are on their way to perdition. So these are words that don't come normally to a 12-year-old mountain girl. These were words that were given to her. So in, if you want a confirmation that this is true, she's predicting a synod that there are none at that time in history. And, and here's another thing. Here's another prediction of the future that didn't make sense to anybody in 1960s when she says, when communism will come again. Well, what do you mean communism? Where is it going? No one thought communism was going anywhere in the 60s. But what happened? The, you know, the loss of the Soviet Union and then it's, you know, it's, it's, it's returning. But just that term, you know, synod, the return of communism, these are terms of the future. So again, to me, another confirmation of what Conchita says came from the Blessed Mother and can only have come from the Blessed Mother. Yeah. It, it seems to me that this synod, the Pope going to Moscow, not just Russia, but Moscow, and, and for everyone who's just joining us maybe a little late, I had scheduled this interview with Glenn Hudson last week to talk about this prophecy of Conchita at Garabandel that the Pope must go to Moscow. And between then and now, literally yesterday, Pope Francis talked about him wanting to go to Moscow on an airplane. He said, I ran that uh, interview at the beginning of this interview. So if you're coming in late and you want to see that, you can go to the beginning and watch it. Another thing that I find interesting about Garabandel, again, I'm, I'm a student here. I'm not an expert like Glenn is. I'm trying to learn, was a message that I found on Garabandel. And Glenn, I want you to tell me if this is legitimate. You kind of just referenced it a couple minutes ago. It's a message dated June 18th. 1965, and this is from Conchita, and it says, quote, many cardinals, bishops, and priests are following the road to perdition. 1965, friends, quote, many cardinals, bishops, and priests are following the road to perdition, and with them they are taking many more souls. Ever less importance is given to the Holy Eucharist. We should turn the wrath of God away from us by our own efforts. If you ask his forgiveness with a sincere heart, he will pardon you. I, your mother, through the intercession of St. Michael the Archangel, wish to tell you that you should make amends. You are now being given the last warnings. I love you very much, and I do not want your condemnation. Ask us sincerely, and we shall grant your plea reflect on the passion of Jesus, end quote. So this is an appeal to repent, to ask Jesus for forgiveness, to meditate on the passion and death of Jesus Christ. But this intro, it seems that Our Lady, if this is legitimate, is saying, look, the cardinals, the bishops, the priests are on the road to perdition, and they're taking souls with them. There's not importance given to the Eucharist. So you lay people, you need to seek and ask me, Our Lady, St. Michael, and you need to reflect on the passion of Jesus. I mean, this is, this is a, if this is true, Glenn, this is pretty powerful. Cardinals, bishops, and priests following the road of perdition, 1965? Yeah, this is her second of two uh, main messages that she gave. And she issued this because the first message that she gave, uh, no one was paying attention to. You know what? The the sad thing is people always expect these um, messages that reveal future events and they want something spectacular in Mary's messages. And a lot of times she's just trying to convey what heaven expects from all of us, you know, and it's it's pretty simple. And she's telling people. Listen, just live a good life. You know, we're not giving you a complicated formula here. It's mass, communion, confession, the rosary, scapula, s simple things, you know, just, just be a good person. And, you know, look at the examples that I gave you of the first three bishops that misled people into believing that this was not a true apparition. How, the, how are they going to stand before God? and explain this. How do you stand before Jesus? Because you call basically her mother a liar. That's the way I feel about it. 
They were they misled generations of people with their lies because they didn't own up to the truth of these apparitions. So Mary releases this statement, this second statement in 65 saying, listen, this is it. I'm telling you, you're being misled. I'm telling you what to do with your lives. You better pay attention. And people better realize, you know, everybody talks about Fatima, Fatima. Fatima didn't get approved until um, 13 years after the miracle of the sun. So that's just something to keep in mind. There's so much evidence about the authenticity of Garabandel, so many miracles, so many messages that are predictions of the future, some that have already come true, others are going to uh, involve in the, in the near future. People better start paying attention. It, it's all coming true right in front of your eyes. Well, and it's, it's, if this is all legit, right? That's what I keep saying. If this is all legit, you know, Padre Pio says in 1962, so what I just read was Conchita in 1965, but in 1962, right. he says, but they will believe when it's too late. So even if it were approved, even then it will be too late. That Has Conchita ever spoken to you about what that means? It'll be too late. It'll be after the miracle, after the illumination of conscience. I mean, what... What does too late here mean? Well, actually, she asked me, uh, and this was a long time ago because we, we've known each other so long. Um, we talked about this. And she asked me, how did I feel about that? And I said, you know what my reaction is? It's like a New Year's Day resolution. I said, you're going to have the warning. You're going to have the miracle. People are going to be hopefully lit on fire. And then that flame kind of kind of starts to go out. You know, it's like a New Year's resolution that's made with the best of intention, but but, but not followed through for very long. You know, and so are people going to remain uh, good? Are they going to come back to church? Are they going to be prayerful? Are they going to be repentant? Maybe in the beginning, sure, but six months down the line, a year down the line, two years down the line, is everybody still going to be that way? And and this is. My biggest concern, and I think that's what Padre Pio was referring to, sure, people will be repentant in the beginning, but are they going to stay that way? And, and, and who knows how long we have before that judgment of, of whether we're going to receive a chastisement or not. But I, I think he has a feeling that that may not happen. Right. And is there any indication about the warning? the illumination of conscience, are people going to repent or are they going to just harden their conscience even more? I mean, does this lead to a global revival of Catholicism? I mean, what is the outcome here? Is there any indication? Well, there really was no indication as to the outcome of the warning, but I can't imagine even the, uh, the hardest of, of souls that when seeing your soul as God sees it, when seeing your sins as he sees it, that don't that won't drop the hardest heart to their knees, sobbing, at least initially. You would and, think. And I hope that it does. I, I, I can't imagine who can see that amount of hurt that we've caused God and not react in some type of positive way. Yeah. I, I, I'm not claiming to be a visionary or anything like that. All right. I'm not, but I, I did have this dream a couple of weeks ago. I mentioned it before on the show. It was in this dream and there's this enormous edifice, but it wasn't like a, a church. And I went inside and there was no mass going on, but there were hundreds of priests and there were like hundreds of lines and everyone was going to confession. And I, I asked around this, this is a, this building was bit, built by a bishop because so many people want to go to confession. And then I asked them, somebody, how many people can go to confession a day here? And they said 4,500 people can go to confession. And I was thinking to myself, this is amazing. So many people are turning back to God. And, I, and I, after I woke up and I thought about this strange dream, I thought, you know, what, what if there was a massive global conversion to Catholicism, you know, 30 minutes or 60 minutes on a Saturday afternoon would not reconcile all the sinners back to God? 
I mean, priests would have massive lines. I mean, if you just imagine, even in America, everyone who says I'm a Catholic and maybe they don't attend mass except on Christmas or Easter, but if all of a sudden these people wanted to go to confession, I don't even know if we'd have enough confessionals or enough priests to get it done, right? I mean, it'd be it'd be a so if there were a illumination of conscience, you would have first of all, you would have millions, hundreds of millions of people saying, "I want to be baptized," because they would they would be pagan, they'd be Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists, I don't know, atheists. But then you'd have a bunch of people who are Catholic who when they see their sins of omission and commission, they would be like, my goodness sake, I have hundreds of sins that I've never even confessed before. I've got to get right with God. I mean, yeah. it, even be, it, it raises the question, would we even be ready as a church to provide the sacramental needs after such an event? Probably not. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, some of the priests are starting to get on board with Garabandel because they're starting to hear, you know, uh, some of these interviews that I'm doing and, and, and putting the pieces together. Um, I have a lot of priests who, who quietly are on my site who ask me, you know, in private for specific facts like you're asking for. And, and you know, they're starting to come around and they're like, oh, my God, we, we can't handle this. We, what am I going to do? I said, I'll, I'll bring you some food. You just sit in the confessional and eat and sleep there. I said, yeah, it's 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 going to be an endless line. Um, I, and like you said, who of us can see that gravity of sin and not want to run to confession that, that instant after the warning? So I, I think the church is going to be inundated with, like you said, with, with confessions, with baptisms, with conversions. So it's all going to be wonderful and, and maybe chaotic all at the same time. Yeah. Now, I really wish I had a graph of the timeline, and I want to go back to it because I want to make sure that I understand it. Because if we're dealing with this illumination of conscience, there's the there's the miracle of the pine and the illumination of conscience. Are they the same thing? Because Conchita says she's going to give an eight day warning. Is that the eight day warning for the pine miracle, or is that the eight day warning for the illumination of conscience, or three days of darkness? Okay. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of info here. I, I'm confused. Yeah, you know what happens is you're bringing in terms from Garamandel and other apparitions. Okay, so the correct warning, me then. The warning. Yeah, the warning. Very easy. The, the warning. warning. Okay. Right, which was what it was called at Garamandel is also the illumination of conscience. Okay. Uh, Conchita actually says, so, uh, Conchita never uh, says illumination of conscience. She just says the warning. She says the warning, and and one time she said the correction of conscience. Um, so it's the same event. So that okay. happens first. And then the miracle, which is the physical miracle back in Garabandil at the pine trees. But what about the so eight day warning? Problem. Okay. So the eight day warning, and again, you know, we're using the word warning, but there's really no other word to, to say, or you could say notice, but eight days before that miracle happens, uh, Conchita is going to notify us. That's probably going to be me and, and some other people. And we're going to disperse the message of when the warning will, ha uh, the miracle will happen. So, and we also know some facts about the miracle. She gave us uh, some clues. So this is Miracle of the Pine. It, the Miracle at the Pines, yes. Eight day so before Miracle know, of the Pine. Yes, yes. You're going to have notice of that eight days in advance. So we know certain specific facts. Um, through my years of, of research, I have pinpointed it to the month of April. Now, she gave the inference of March, April, or May in one interview, but uh, I have found two stories uh, in books that are undeniably uh, solid in their facts, and they point to the month of April. So I'm very confident when I say the month of April. So I know it's April. Conchita also told us that it would be between the 8th and the 16th of April. So we know that. Sounds we like know Easter. That it's gonna be, yeah. So it's going to be also on a Thursday night. So in most years, most years, not all, but in most years, there's only a singular Thursday 
between the 8th and 16th of April. It'll happen 8.30 at night, it's Spanish time. And it will also happen on the feast of a young male martyr of the Eucharist. So we have all of those clues to help pinpoint us um, towards that particular day. But she will give us eight days notice. Now, you, I mean, you've probably done the research. I mean, it's not that hard to figure out eight, between April 8th and the 16th on a Thursday with a male martyr of the Eucharist. Come on, Glenn, tell us what the day is. <laughs> well, it, it's a little bit harder than you would think. I'll, I'll tell you why, because I've probably gone through a thousand names of, of saints and to find someone that fits the actual criteria of everything that she said, and there, there's a list, um, it's, it's a little harder than you think. Uh, most of the saints are uh, much older than a young martyr, a young male martyr of the Eucharist. Um, so you can you can uh, disqualify quite a few saints just from their age. Okay. Um, but I think that once the warning happens, I'll look toward the next April. You know, following the warning, that will be my my guess as to when it's going to happen. So. So I mean, just to clarify here, the eight day we got two warnings. Warning. Here, okay, <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. The eight day yeah. announcement is eight days before right. the miracle at the pines. Yes. All right, and then where does the warning, aka illumination of conscience, is that before or after? That's before. So uh, as I said earlier, right. the warning will happen first, and you'll experience the gravity of those sins and then to back it up then the miracle will happen so that you've had the warning you you gain that knowledge and then the miracle is a confirmation that what you experienced could have only come from god okay so i just typed it up on the screen you can't see it glenn but i put timeline global warning of conscience then later eight days before conchita tells people Miracle of Pines, and that's going to happen in April between the 8th and the 16th on a Thursday at 8.30 8 p.m. Spanish time on the Feast of a Young Male Martyr of the Eucharist. Right. Did I get that right? That's, that's the, the criteria for the miracle, yes. Not, not her announcement. Her announcement is just eight days before. Right. So the, yeah. the, the announcement is not on the feast of a young male martyr of the Eucharist. The actual no, no. miracle no, is miracle. on the... Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can send you all of this if you would like in detail. So. Boy, it's a lot. Is there a concise, yes, is. Is there a concise <laughs> booklet that lays all this out? No, but I, I, I post all of this information uh, on all okay. of my pages. Um, I, I run 15 language pages simultaneously. So oh. um, if, you, if your audience speaks different languages, you can also contact me on the English page, and I'll give you the link to uh, other foreign languages. Okay. And that's, is that, a, it's the, what's the name of the Facebook page? The Message of Garabandel. The message of Garabandel on Facebook. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Can you mention uh, one thing that I was kind of a little bit unusual here was the night of the screams. What's that about? Okay. So the girls experienced um, two back-to-back -back nights of visions. And the first night was the night of a tribulation's before the miracle. So remember I explained to you earlier that once the Pope goes to Moscow, hostilities break out in Europe and this whole war or could be a, quite a larger one starts to escalate to the point where it gets uh, untenable and, the, and God has to bring the warning. So they saw a vision of this time of tribulation before the miracle. The second night, they saw the tribulation period of the chastisement and what it looked like. So those were the two visions and, and they were, the townspeople were so horrified after the second night that 
the entire town went to confession the next morning. That's how scared they were, just from the looks on the girls' faces and their expressions. And, and, and the chastisement is the three days of darkness? Yes, I believe those to be the same exact event. Okay, so the, um, sc and, the and, screams, and the terror that, but, was them seeing what would be the three days of darkness. Is that right? I believe so, yes. Okay. Have you ever asked Conchita, hey, what did you see? Was it three days of darkness? Uh, I didn't. I didn't have to say. I didn't have to ask her. Um, there was one quote from her, and it matches exactly to other uh, descriptions that I've read. Uh, some from saints. So I, I, I won't speak about other people, but I will tell you what uh, Conchita said. And her and Mary Lilly both issued almost the same exact vision, where Conchita said it's worse than being enveloped by fire from above and below. Mm. And Mary Lowley, Mary Lowley described the chastisement as a, a sea of fire. Uh, and that even if you jumped into the water, it would have been worse than being burned alive. So wow. fire seems to be the, the common theme of this, this chastisement. And it, it does match with, with, several other uh, visions that I've read. And is that, is this fire somehow associated with the three days of darkness? It's, it's going to be, I believe the punishment that's administered by God, if the world doesn't repent. So there's going to be the three days of darkness. And then I believe if you're caught outside, uh, you're going to experience this. Okay. Okay. Great. And then some people in the live chat have said that you have said that it's not St. Tarsisius as the young male martyr of the Eucharist. Is that correct? Yeah. The reason I said that because his feast day is August, is in August, I believe August 15th. Okay. So, so I, I've already established, yeah, I've already established the fact that uh, the miracle is in April. Okay. And then people in the audience have also said that Conchita has said something very important about abortion. Is there something uh, that she said with regard to that that comes to mind, or is that just something odd? No, no, not at all. Um, she was she was confused by Mary's uh, statements. You know, when when in in uh, the Blessed Mother's two main messages, in one of them she talks about the cup overflowing, and and that's a direct uh reference to abortion and and imagine if you will if the if god and the blessed mother are upset about abortion in 1961 or 1965 by the end of this right. imagine what what they're feeling now how bad it's gotten how how unthinkable it's gotten these levels um so there was a conversation with her and it was a lengthy conversation because Conchita didn't quite understand. Again, she's such a, a, a beautiful, simple girl, mountain girl. At 12 years old, she doesn't understand. How does a mother kill a baby in its stomach? You know, so there was a whole conversation about this. But it, it also, uh, she explained about how grievous a sin this is. So uh, I, I can't even imagine, you know, their, uh, their grief over abortion. Um, but again, if you would like, I'll, I'll send you the whole story uh, of, of what transpired during that, that, uh, that ecstasy. Yeah. Now, let's say, you know, Francis just said, hey, I'm going, I want to go to Moscow. I need to go to Moscow. If he goes to Moscow, I mean, we got to buckle up, right? I mean, this, I mean, it's, and, and I'll, I mean, Conchita is, is how old does she turn tomorrow? 74. 74. So... I mean, we got to be getting close here. If the Pope is chomping at the bit to get to Moscow, I mean, what is your plan if the next thing you read, uh, Pope Francis this April is going to Moscow? What, what is Glenn Hudson doing? Doubling up on my daily rosary. <laughs> <laughs> right. <You laughs> getting know, there's, the confession. There's not a, yeah, there's not a lot. Uh, well, I, I, do, I, I got smart years ago. I listened to Conchita's advice. 
And uh, I started to go to confession at, le- at least twice, uh, twice a month, if not more. Yeah. Because it makes it so much that's easier to go frequently. Yeah. Yeah. That's my um, goal. So, but uh, in, 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 in reference to what we were just talking about, there isn't a lot that I can do. Um, I, I believe that the prophecies are going to happen. All I can do is what Mary asked was to, to lead the best life that I can and to try to help others to do the same and, and try to get this message out to people because you can see it's, it's unfolding right in front of our eyes. It's not in the future so far that it's unimaginable. It, it's within our grasp very soon. And all of those events are within our lifetime, I believe. So um, it's not far away. People need to change. And, and that's why I'm so grateful that you uh, give me this opportunity to tell people about Gar- 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 And it's And again, you know, Conchita, the most important thing Conchita ever said was not about any of, any of this. You know what she said? Just live the messages. Live the messages. So those messages, again, you know, confession, church. Communion, confession, rosary, scapula. That, that's all that this really Garabandel is about. Just change your life and, and, and act the way you should. Just be good. And that's really the most important thing she's ever said. More important than these prophecies is just live the messages. Right. Which is, I mean, I say at the end of every single podcast, pray the rosary every single day. You know, you need to be... Praying, the easiest way to pray. I always say the rosary is is for masters in the prayer life. It's also for beginners. It's a training wheels. It gets it teaches you how to pray for at least about 18 to 20 minutes. We all need that at least every day, 18 to 20 minutes. So pray your rosary every single day. You're not on the team. You got to pray the rosary. You got to wear your scapular. Um, you got to go to confession. Every two weeks, every two to four weeks is, I mean, pretty much any saint or any good spiritual advisor that I've ever heard said every two to four weeks. So make that happen. Receive Holy Communion devoutly. Prepare on Saturday nights beforehand. If you can, receive daily, but be prepared. So that's the message. There's no, there's, there's really no other extra gimmick or sacramental instituted by Conchita or this or this apparition, it's it's to live what I, what we call the normal Catholic norms of of a pious life. Yeah. Well, simple. Glenn, I, I thank you for your time. You've given us an hour and a half, and this has been very thorough. I, I I hope the audience sees that I've been honest and I've asked the tough questions, and I think Glenn's been very good in fielding the tough questions. Um, I'm going to continue to do research, so I'd encourage people to subscribe to this channel, hit the bell so you're notified of future events, especially with the Pope saying he wants to go to Moscow. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. And um, Glenn, I hope you're—I hope you've had a good interview with me. And if I have more questions, maybe you can come back on and we can do a follow-up because I'm definitely going to spend the next few weeks studying this topic. Uh, that would be great. Again, I invite you to join my page. I, I think yes. there's a wealth of information there. Um, I have built a private library called the files. So okay. it probably answers 40 of the most basic questions that people ask. Okay. And I, I would love for you to reach out to me and ask me any question that bothers you because I'm, I'm sure I could answer it for you. Yes. To your satisfaction. Now there's uh, there's people in the, in the live audience there, some are saying that it's, is it a page or is it a group on Facebook? I just want, you know, for people looking for it, is it, what is it? It's a, it's a separate page on, okay. on, on Facebook. Yeah. Got it. Called the message of Garabandel. Got it. Okay. Very good. Well, everyone, you can be certain I'll be doing more research. I'm skeptical, but I'm being persuaded, Glenn. So I'm open to this. Um, so like I said, I got to do more research. I want to be thorough about all this. Um, can we close with a prayer? I think it would be good if maybe we did an, a, a pray in Our Father, a Hail Mary, and a St. Michael prayer. How's that sound? Absolutely. All right. Oremos. Uh, we'll pray. Uh, we'll do the Our Father, 
in uh, we'll do Our Father and Hail Mary in Latin, and then we'll do the Saint Michael prayer. Do I have that? Yeah, I got that in English. We'll do that in English though, because not everybody knows that one as well. So we'll do the Our Father in Latin. Oremus nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Patro noster, qui es in celi sanctificetur nomen tuum, advenia regnum tuum, fia voluntas tua, secut in cello et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, se libera nos amalo. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum, Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et mortis nostre. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits, who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Amen. Our Lady of Fair Love, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Peter and St. Paul, pray for us. Nomine Patris et Fidi, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Glenn. Everybody go check out the Garabondel page. I'm going to go over there and get into your files and download all that stuff, Glenn, and read it. Um, make sure you're praying right. your rosary every single day. Uh, you know, you may not make it to something supernatural in the beginning, a warning or something. You might have a heart attack tonight. You never know. You got to be prepared to meet the Lord every single day. So get to confession. If you're not Catholic and you're watching this, join the church, seek out holy baptism. If you are in the church, get right with God, reconcile with God. If you're in an irregular marriage or a bad situation like that, you need to get that figured out. We don't all have all the time in the world. It's time to get right with the Lord. And I think these kind of apparitions, these discussions remind us that the most important thing is to spend eternity with God Almighty in heaven and not in hell, away from God. So repent, have faith, believe. Glenn Hudson, thanks so much. Everybody go check out his uh, Facebook page. I'll be doing more research, and, and maybe we can have another talk in the future. I'd love that. Thank you so much, Dr. Marshall, for your All time right. today. Thank you. Everybody, thanks for watching. Uh, please check out uh, the new St. Thomas Institute, where I do online courses. And until next time, remember, our Lord Jesus Christ said, you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless. Godspeed. Thank you so much, Glenn Hudson. Thank you.